chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 3. We are looking at the names of God. We've come to the second. We looked this morning at Elohim. And uh, now we're looking at, tonight, at Jehovah. The part two here, we have the names of God. Chapter 3, Exodus. Let's read the first 15 verses of the chapter. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D in our King James Bible, is always what? Jehovah. Yes. Ask Brother Kurt. He knows through the years. And he, he, he appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel did come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and uh, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said, unto God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with thee and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Moses said unto God, behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. We're looking at the varied names of God that are found in scriptures. There are many titles. There are many names. You say, why in the world would the Lord give very, there are primary names, but there are names that God gives for purpose. Why? So we can better comprehend and understand who he is. All of those names have meanings. And we talked about that this morning. We name people by varied ways, but not even thinking about their meaning. What's that name? What's that mean? Well, God takes names or has names 
And uh, they all mean something. And it does us well to find out what the Bible teaches they mean so that we might uh, be full of information so we can have a brain that's, that knows a bunch of... No, no. God wants us to be more than just academic. He wants us to have real personal relationship with Him. Amen. That's what all of it's to lead to personal relationship with the true and living God. And so, uh, we, uh, we look at these names, and these names give us accurate uh, and right concept of God. Too many times people have inaccurate uh, thought about the true and living God and what He's like. And so we saw Elohim, the creator God. Genesis chapter 1, 31 times Genesis chapter 1. Elohim said, and Elohim said, and Elohim said, and Elohim creates, and he creates, and he creates. He's the creator God. He is the creator. Not only that, we saw that he's complex. Plural. Elohim. Any him at the end of a Hebrew word is plural. And so we saw that uh, it's, uh, this Old Testament name gives us, uh, at least in seed form, the truth about the Trinity. That God is a triunity. That he's a trinity. More fully revealed throughout scripture. But never completely explained. Or revealed. Anybody dare to get up and tell us all about the Trinity? You can't do it. And we'll have to get to heaven to get it. And then when we get there, we may not even still get it. But Jehovah, now, tonight, is the name that we're going to look at. It's always, nearly always, in our Bible, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And it is used 5,321 times in your Old Testament. Jehovah. And this is the name of God. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. Which is what? Jehovah. Get with me now. Help me. I need help. I am the Lord. That is my name. Isaiah 42, and eight. The name Jehovah comes from two Hebrew verbs. It means to be, that which means to be or to live. Uh, it speaks to us of the uh, God's, uh, he's self-existent. It tells us about who he is and what he's like. He's the living God. He is alive. Each Hebrew word comes from a what they call a pri primitive root, a uh, three-letter root, and uh, it's. I can get, give example in Latin. Latin does the same thing. It has root words. There's the word ped. Ped. You know what the word ped means? P e d. Foot. So off of that, then we make words, or they make words. They, they made the word pedal, like on a bicycle. They make the word pedestrian, one who's walking on his feet. They, they make the word podiatrist, a doctor who'll tend to your feet. And so, all come from that one word, that one root. And so that's the same way Hebrew works. It has a root. And in Exodus chapter 3, I tell you that to tell you this. In Exodus chapter number 3, Moses, he has this special meeting with God. God's going to commission him. And Moses inquires about God's name. And God said, I am that I am. And I am hath sent you. That is the root, that word, is the root for Jehovah. Heya. Jehovah. It's the root 
of the word Jehovah. I am that I you can pin, you can pin that in your Bible. And if you don't like to pin it in your Bible, pin it on your hand and then write it on a piece of paper somewhere or something. Okay? That's why we picked this chapter. God says, This is my name. I am, which is Jehovah. It means to be or to live. The self-existing one. Uh, there, there's been much, I would mention just in passing, that there has been uh, much to do about how it's pronounced. There are those who say, well, it's Yahweh. Or somebody says, well, it's, the name should be pronounced Jehovah. And the reason being is because Hebrews, Jews, through the generations, did not pin the name with any kind of vowels. So then whenever they put them in, they put Adonai vowels in. And they were all wrapped up about how it should be pronounced. The fact of the matter is, often they wouldn't even say it. And it got to the place, it wasn't just, it may have begun with just a reverence toward God. I won't even speak His name. It may have gotten or come from that, but it became a superstition. Like, oh, don't dare say God's name. He'll strike you dead. Something. That was the mindset. Having said all that, somebody says, well, it's not, you don't pronounce it right, Jehovah. You don't pronounce it right. And they try to say, use that kind of thing. Listen, I don't care how it's pronounced. I'm concerned about what it means. That's what matters. What does the name Jehovah mean? It means that He is the self-existing one. It means that He's the great I am. It means that He is not the I was or I shall be, but He's ever, everlastingly, eternally the I am. He is always Present tense. God. The I am. And so let's look at Jehovah and see him in this third chapter of Exodus tonight. I would say first of all that Jehovah is personal. Personal. Moses is keeping the flock of God. He comes to Mount Horeb. All of a sudden, there's a burning bush that's not consumed. It's on fire, but it's still a bush. Every bit of it, not a leaf burnt, not a branch burnt from it. And so he turns aside, and uh, it says, And when, verse 4, And when the Lord, Jehovah, saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. The first thing that I would have you to note is that God Almighty came to Moses and he, in a burning bush, and drew his attention, so he'd have to pay attention, and then talked to him and called for him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, what's that teach me? It teaches me that Jehovah is personal. He is personal. He comes speaking to people. He's all about it. Today, God's revealed Himself to us, not, not in visible or verbal ways like He did to Moses, audibly and, and such, and burning bushes, but He does come and speak to us. He speaks to us in what we call general revelation. He speaks to us in conscience, in creation, in science, in birds, in anything that's in the creation. He speaks to us about when, when it's, we study about, like we mentioned this morning, about the sun being a certain distance. So otherwise we would burn to death if it's too close, if it's too far away. The, everything on planet earth would freeze and all of those kind of things. And we see God. In all of creation. 
and in conscience, Romans chapter 1, Psalm 19, in general revelation. But he also comes speaking in specific revelation, and that is through the Word of God. That's why we are all about studying the Bible. The Word of God. Because if anything's going to get done in my heart or your heart, it's going to come from Holy Scripture. It is God's revelation to us. It's God speaking to us. So it's my job as preacher to explain it. Just try to explain it. God speaks in special revelation by, his, by the Savior. He's spoken as all of these varied ways. Hebrews 1 said, but in these last days, He's spoken unto us through His Son. And we've gotten New Testament revelation and uh, Scripture and truth. Why? Why is all of that? So that we might know Him personally. He, he Jehovah is personal. He's not an inanimate object, something that's out there that is the deist God that says, oh yeah, I'm just hands off. No, 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 that's not him whatsoever. He wants personal relationship with us. 2 Corinthians six eighteen said, here's what the Lord said. And I will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Jesus comes and he said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. We'll sit down and have supper together. We'll sit down and fellowship together. He wants to have personal relationship with us. So this first truth is he comes speaking. Moses, Moses. To have personal relationship. Matthew Henry said, by the light of nature, we see God as a God above us. By the light of the law, we see him as God against us. But by the light of the gospel, we see him as Emmanuel. God who wants to be with us. He wants to be with us. God, this Jehovah is personal. Secondly, Jehovah is particular. Verse 5 and 6. Moses is looking things over. And God calls to him. And he says, God says to him, Draw not nigh hither. Don't come any closer. Get your shoes off. This is holy ground. God says. God is particular about how we approach Him. He's a holy God. We're humans that have sin about us. And so there's a problem. And unless something happens, there cannot be a meeting. Something must take place. And God says, there's a particular way that you are to approach me. There's a particular way that you are to talk to me. There's a particular way that you are to worship me. Draw not nigh. Only by substitutionary sacrifice. Can we approach God and connect with God? That, that's, that's Jehovah's message all the way from Genesis chapter 4, I guess we'd say. All the way through, there's going to be a Lamb of God that must be slain. His name's Jesus Christ the Lord. Otherwise, it's not even possible for Jehovah to have relationship with sinners. So the Lord is particular, isn't He? 
He's particular. Not only that, but thirdly, Jehovah is present. It, what do we have here? Moses' backside of the desert and all this stuff that's going on in Israel fed up to hear with Egypt and they're crying out to God and saying, oh God, would you please deliver me? Would you please do something for me? And all of that, now we're told in this chapter, verse 7 through 9 particularly, it says, God says, Jehovah says, I have surely seen. Verse 7. He says in verse 8, I am come down. Verse number 9, the cry of the children of Israel has come up unto me. So Jehovah sees, he hears, he knows. He is the I am, present tense, always present. He sees, he hears, he knows. We mustn't ever think that God's a million miles away. Sometimes you do. He's ever present. He is the ever present God. Never off the clock. Never sleeping. Never out of touch. Never unaware of what's happening in your life. Never! He sees. He hears. He knows. And then what's he tell? Moses. In verse number 12, he said, Certainly, Moses is reserved, is in reservation about this whole thing. Oh, me going back to them and all this kind of business, and how's that going to work out? And the Lord said, certainly, I will be with thee. He's present. And of course, we know New Testament text. He promises He will never leave us nor forsake us. This is Him. He's present. Psalm 46 and 1. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. He's present. He is present. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why? Because God is present. I can come and talk to him right now about a need that I've got that needs to be met, whatever it is, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever that need is, material, God will tend to it because he's ever present. Oh, he's a million miles away. He is not. You say, but I'm in sin like David. He's a million miles away. No, you feel like he's a million miles away, but he's the omnipresent God. He's here. Amen. <laughs> what about it? Yeah. So he's present. Fourthly, Jehovah is pur pur purposeful. In verse 10 through 12. I've already read the text, so I'm not taking time to read all those verses, okay? Verse 10 through 12, I'm just telling you what they say. God always has a plan and works His plan. God is going to deliver His people from Egypt's bondage. He's going to deliver His people. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He's up to something. And He always is. Today, He's got a purpose. Whatever He's about, it's all about our deliverance. It was Israel's deliverance from Egypt in the Old Testament. It is sinners' deliverance from sin and satanic power in New Testament. Or even throughout all Testaments. And so he's the great deliverer. Delivering us from the power of darkness into translating us into the kingdom of his dear son. The name, this name Jehovah is uh, used in redemption over and over and over again. Uh, like Psalm 19, 14 said, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. 
Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Jehovah is my Redeemer. He's my Redeemer. The first seven chapters of Leviticus, which is the Old Testament uh, system of sacrifice, right? Leviticus. Elohim occurs once alone and then once with Jehovah name, Lord God. But it occurs 86 times in the first seven chapters Jehovah does. 86 times. Not twice. But 86 times in those first seven chapters. The 16th chapter, the chapter on atonement, only the name of Jehovah is used. And it's used 12 times. You say, what in the world is that all about? Because it's all about sinners being able to again come back in fellowship with holy God. Right? And so you have Jehovah. The name Jehovah. He's the Redeemer. He is purposeful. And His plan is to redeem us. Fifth, are we at five? Anybody keeping notes? Jehovah is patient. Verse 11 through 13, God tells Moses what to do. Moses objects and God is patient with Moses. God continues to talk to him. God continues to uh, assure him. You do know that God sees our inadequacies. And yet, he, it teaches us that he can use less than sufficient people That'll make a Baptist hack. He can use less than sufficient people. I'm so impatient. I just told Moses to hit the road. I'm tired of fooling with you. You're bringing up questions every time I've got an answer. Forget it. I'll get Aaron. I'll go ahead. I'll get somebody else. I don't need you. Not so with the Lord. Moses is his man. And he's sticking with him. When everybody else abandons him. Back to the matter. <laughs> and whenever he doesn't show himself so good. Many times. Like. Thinking that he's. A big tough guy back in Egypt killing people and so on. And God sticks with him. And continues to use him. What wonder what kind of patience Jehovah is showing to us tonight. Sanders, I told you what I wanted you to do. I know, Lord, but I'll get around to it. Huh? Right? He's patient with us. Thank God for his patience. Number six. I've only got 106. Number six, Jehovah is a promiser. I notice how many times I will is found in Exodus 3. Look at verse number 10. Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And then verse number 12, it says, And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee. Look at verse number 17 of the chapter. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of Canaan, unto so and so that flows with milk and honey. Verse 20. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. Verse 21. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians and so on. What do we have here? 
we have the Lord giving promise. I will. Ah, uh, we'll see about it. We'll try it. We'll, I don't know. We'll put a big question mark over this whole thing. I'm not quite sure that's, but we'll try it. We'll see if it'll work. out. If you'll do what you're supposed to do, Moses, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll get this. No, no, he said, I'm going to. He said, even if I have to drag you to get you there. Or beat the fire out of you to get you there. Right? He said, I'm going to get this done. And he gives promises to him. He's the great promiser tonight. He's the covenant giving God. He's, he is, this is Jehovah in particular. Elohim is the creator God. The creator name of God. Jehovah is the covenant name of God. It's the name that is used making covenants and promises to his people. Genesis 8, you would find that he makes promise to Noah. Abraham, Genesis 12, 13, 15. Moses, Exodus chapter 20, all the way through to the 31st. Jehovah is the name that's used making these promises, making this covenant, connecting with this, with a particular people and so on. So, he's the promiser. When you think of Jehovah, you think of covenant. He promises. God is faithful to keep his promises. Krumacher says God's promises are obligations he imposes upon himself. Think of it like that. God's imposed an obligation on himself for me. Whenever he says, I'm going to do this. So I can come to him and talk to him. And say, Lord, you're the one that put the obligation on yourself. No, we, we shouldn't come like that. <laughs> but we come and, and we're just affirmed in our heart. He's taken the burden on himself to fulfill this thing like he said that he would. Surely he will. I love what A.W. Pink said. He said, because God has promised certain things, we can ask for them with full assurance of faith. And why don't we? He's the promiser. Number seven. Jehovah is powerful. Verse number 19 and 20. When Moses went to Pharaoh and told him what Je Jehovah said, let my people go. God, it says here in, the, in those verses, God work wonders. What did he do? The ten plagues. He, he brought the plagues and all of them were targeted against the false gods of Egypt. So, Jehovah God is powerful. Second Chronicles 14, 11 puts it like this. The Lord is our God. You say, well, there's not much to that. Until you understand the language. Capital L-O-R-D. Jehovah is our Elohim. This covenant keeping, this promising God that comes to us in personal relationship. He's also the creator who has power to do what's needed to be done for you and I. He's powerful. Number eight. Jesus is Jehovah. The personal, powerful, promising 
God. John chapter number 8 in our New Testament. We have just read Exodus chapter number 3. God said, here's my name. My name is I am. I am. The root name of Jehovah. I am. And then in John chapter number 8 in the New Testament, the Jews asked Jesus, who are you? And Jesus declares himself in verse 12, verse 16, verse 18, verse 23, verse 24, and verse number 28. He claims this name, I am. And then, verse number 53 of John 8, the Jews ask, are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And Jesus answered, get it, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> What, what, what in the world does all of that mean? What's that mean? It tells us that Jesus was in existence before Abraham was born. Right? Well, sure. Before Abraham was, I am. But it tells us much more than that. Just like it did the Jews. He's not saying that he was. You hear me? Oh, yeah, you talk about Abraham back there? Yeah. Well, I was back there too. I was. Oh, no, no. That, that's not. He is saying that. But he's saying more than that. He's saying. I am. And he's claiming to himself that he's Jehovah. He's the eternal I am. The eternal self-existing one. Ever-present one. The enemy's got the point because then that next verse, verse 59, says they took up stones to kill him because he claimed to be God. They got the point. And that's exactly what he was claiming. See, the Old Testament called for the death penalty for anybody who would claim to be God. And Jesus just did it. The name Jesus comes from Yeshua, Joshua, Old Testament Hebrew, and it means Jehovah saved. And Jesus is Jehovah doing the work that had to be done to save sinners. There are lots of people, even religions, that are satisfied for Jesus to be just a wise teacher. You do know that the Muslims think that Jesus is a wise teacher. There are others, liberal theologians, who don't even believe all the Bible. They still believe he was a wise teacher. Jehovah's Witnesses. They believe he's a wise teacher. But he's much more than that. He is God. Jesus 
is Jehovah. The true and living God. Jehovah's personal, particular, present, purposeful, patient, promiser, powerful, and Jehovah is Jesus. Miss Linda, will you come please? Let's stand. Do you have a song? Number 19. Number 19. Do you know him? He wants you to know him tonight. Emmanuel, God with us. You say, I feel like God's against me. Yeah, if you've never repented of sins and relied on Christ, He is. But thank God He comes to us. Calling and saying, why don't you get on the right side of things? I've paid the sacrifice at Calvary's cross. The justice of God is satisfied if you'll have it. But as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. You can get in the family of God by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, to talk by talking to him, by crying out to him. Wash your sins away. Is that your prayer? Wash all my sins away. Do you know you're a sinner? Why don't you call on him? If you're not saved tonight, call on him. And and ask him to wash your sins away. Wash your sins away. Before we dismiss tonight.